so I wanted to firstly uh, thank all of you for, for joining us today um, to our first webinar for the Gratitude in the Workplace Challenge, um, sponsored by Great, Greater Good Science Center. We're very excited uh, to be running this challenge as, as we think it really um, speaks to uh, sort of a future evolution of, of workplace behavior and interactions and experiences uh, that, that we think are really valuable as we continue to evolve sort of the future of work together. Um, we, uh, just on a few logistics, um, we'll be kicking off the ideas phase uh, next Wednesday, September 27th. So if you haven't uh, participated in the research phase of the challenge, we encourage you to do so. Uh, but most importantly, we really encourage you to jump in and submit an idea uh, either with the team, with your workplace, or individually um, throughout the ideas phase, which again kicks off next uh, Wednesday, September 27th. And so we uh, wanted to introduce our um, special guest uh, today, which is uh, Emilia Simone Thomas. Uh, she's a PhD and the science director of the Greater Good Science Center, uh, where she oversees uh, GGSC's fellowship program. She's a co-instructor of its Science of Happiness online course and helps run uh, its expanding gratitude project. Um, her training is in social and effective neuroscience. And we're just really thrilled to have her joining us today because she's quite the expert and just has a tremendous depth of knowledge on this topic. So we'll hand it over to her while she kicks things off and uh, she'll be doing a brief introduction and then we'll jump into Q&A for the latter half. Um, so I hand it over to Em, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Chris, for that very humbling introduction. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to participate in meaningful and far reaching campaigns like this one. And it's a real treat for the Greater Good Science Center to be working with IDEO on this gratitude in the workplace challenge. So nice to meet you all. Anybody who's joining us from wherever you are, thank you for taking the time out to um, have this conversation and let me explain some of the background uh, that, that we've gathered in the scientific community around what gratitude is and why it's important. Um, I'm going to switch from my talking face to slides. Um, this is just a helpful way to get some of the ideas across and um, make it easier for people to access and remember some of the information. So again, nice to meet you. And here I'm going to switch to, to a slide view. Um, here we go. All right. So again, what I'd like to do is really give you a, a simple primer for the scientific literature on gratitude as a real tractable construct, um, rather than as many might assume a sign of politeness or uh, another kind of culturally um, delivered or passed down skill. While there are ways that our life and our habits and um, our experiences do influence whether or not we experience or feel or express gratitude frequently, uh, scientists have taken on this topic in a rigorous and thoughtful way to really clarify its role in human mental health. So we always like to start with some definition because as it clarifies the space for everyone when we're having a conversation. Um, many different people have different ideas about what gratitude is. Some think it's a specific emotional experience that happens in a short period of time. Some would argue it's sort of a, a personality trait, something that uh, we take with us in every situation, in every context. Uh, and, and scientifically, it really gets thought about in both of those ways. Uh, both, uh, we study it by trying to elicit real-time experiences of gratefulness in the moment, and we also study it by looking at what people think about themselves and they think about gratitude in the, in the broader scheme. I'm, an, I'm sharing with you on this slide two uh, descriptions of gratitude or two explanations, definitions of gratitude from Bob Emmons. Bob Emmons is really uh, one of the pioneers, uh, foremost thinkers in the space of gratitude. He's a professor at UC Davis and has been publishing and studying and writing books about gratitude for 25 years now. Uh, if you're interested, you can Google him, find his books, and they're all a very uh, worthy read. So Bob calls gratitude uh, in a more broad sense of things, a feeling of reverence for things that are given. So we think of gratitude as really looking out at the world as a place that provides, right? It's not a place that costs or that uh, threatens, but rather 
we're seeing the world in this broad uh, frame as, as something that, that, that supports and provides for us. This is thinking of gratitude in the, in the broader scheme. Um, in a more specific uh, rendering, Bob calls gratitude an experience that comes from noticing that something good has happened to you that you really haven't, haven't had to exert effort towards and that in, in large part is the result of somebody else's effort. So again, it's not just this cosmic the world is providing, but rather something about the goodness in my life is the result of other people's actions and efforts. So this is a beginning uh, effort to really clarify the conceptual domain. What is gratitude and how do scientists think about and define it? Um, a third definition that I'd like to share with you is from Mike McCullough. Uh, professor in the University of, of Florida in Miami, who also is an expert and an early thinker and mover and shaker in the space of gratitude science. So Mike McCullough got even more specific and he offers this definition based on research where he's really asked people very pointedly about what makes them feel more grateful and what maybe elicits gratitude, but perhaps a lighter or less um, prominent uh, experience of it. And, and what Mike says is that people feel grateful when they have benefited from someone else's costly. That means someone else has put effort in and you know that they put effort into it. Intentional. So that means the other person did it thinking, I'm going to do this take this action, I'm gonna behave in this way because it's going to be helpful to something self-transcendent, something more than just my own self-interest and voluntary. So I'm not doing this because somebody else forced me to do it. So these are interesting variables that influence the magnitude uh, and the sort of strength of the experience of gratitude that Mike McCullough has pulled out. And you'll see these themes come back out when we talk about research on on how to actually strengthen or bolster or perhaps um, make uh, more habitual your experiences of gratitude day in and day out. So we've covered the gratitude space conceptually. What does it really mean and how do we think about it? And, and I wanna now back up and, and, and share with you a very complicated looking chart, but don't worry, I'm gonna explain exactly what's important about it. This is an early paper by Mike and Bob, Mike McCullough and Bob Emmons, where they asked a large number of people, um, they, they distributed a survey, they asked a large number of people, how grateful are you? And they used two different measures, a six item measure and a 12 item measure. Actually, the 12 item measure is, is gathered from a third person, so not the individual themselves, but someone they knew. Uh, and these measures uh, ultimately provide an index of how much, how grateful a person is, right? In the overarching sense, how grateful are you? And then um, along the left column, which is not highlighted in yellow, are other measures of well-being. So satisfaction with life. Um, how much anxiety do you feel? Um, how, uh, what is your personality like? And I'm jumping from the left square to the right square in, in naming a few of these items. And what I want you to notice as you look down the highlighted in yellow columns is if you see a row that is a type of measure that looks like it's good for you, like being satisfied with your life or being optimistic or having lots of hope, you tend to see a positive number with lots of little stars by it, little asterisks. asterisks. And what, what that means is that there was a positive correlation. That means gratitude predicted, reliably predicted, higher gratitude reliably predicted higher scores on these measures of well-being. And if you look where you see negative values, those tend to be dimensions of well-being that are undesirable, like stress, anxiety, depression, neuroticism. So uh, this is an early, very expansive assessment of why gratitude is good for a person. It really predicts being better off on pretty much every other measure of well-being that we've been able to gather. This, as you can see, is a paper from 2002, and we've yet to find a subsequent study looking at the same kind of relationships that counteracts this. Wherever we look, being more grateful adds to the strength of your well-being and wellness and uh, longevity. Um, just to summarize some of the other findings that we've realized about gratitude, 
And here I put dispositional and practiced because there are two different ways that we test gratitude. Dispositional means what's your personality like? How are you right now as a result of many combinations of genetic and experiential aspects of your, of your life and body? Practice means we bring people into the lab and we actually give them some kind of activity that amounts to studying or experiencing gratitude or reflecting on what they're grateful for. And it turns out in both of these kinds of assessments, what gratitude is tied to is being more optimistic, being more pro-social. Pro-social means that you're invested in the welfare of, of others. You're not focusing explicitly or exclusively on things that serve your own self-interest. Gratitude, both in, in, in the dispositional and the practice sense, makes you less likely to experience certain kinds of negative states and, and to harbor antisocial sentiments, hostility and anger. When you are more grateful, you don't experience these negative states as robustly and they don't last as long. So I just wanna make sure at this moment that I don't give the impression that gratitude is some kind of panacea that solves all problems and that you should never feel things that are challenging because being challenged, feeling angry, feeling sad, feeling anxious are all important to the human condition. The trick is not to feel them for too long. And gratitude is a really important uh, tool for not wallowing or getting lost in the more difficult uh, emotional responses to life's difficulties. Um, gratitude also helps us sort of maintain a sense of enjoyment and pleasure from the positive experiences in life. So one uh, issue that humans struggle with is that, sure, good things happen, but after a while we get used to them and they don't feel so good anymore. So um, this puts us in what might be called the hedonic treadmill, constantly striving for something even better. Well, one way to sort of back off on that, that possibility is really to cultivate and practice gratitude, which enables us to find joy and pleasure and contentment in what's right in front of us instead of feeling like, what's in front of us just isn't good enough anymore. Um, gratitude also changes our focus away from our personal needs and threats in a way that has been measured. Instead of engaging these uh, biological systems that are really focused on vigilance to threat and self-focus or self-referential thinking, what's happening to me, what happened to me earlier, what's happening to me later, people who are more grateful tend to engage systems that are tracking what's really going on around you socially and uh, in, your, in your environmental context. Um, in specific populations, researchers have shown that when people are more grateful and then they have a traumatic experience, they suffer less from post-traumatic stress. And this ranges from people who enter wartime scenarios and also the, the challenges associated with uh, major life transitions like leaving home and going away to college. And again, it turns out when you're a more grateful person, you can handle these stressful situations. Also, when people who have experienced stressful scenarios actually engage in a, in a practical exercise or training in gratitude, they also uh, recover more quickly from the, the conditions or the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. People who are more grateful are more likely to help others. They're better at cooperating. They're more likely to commit and contribute their resources to the welfare of others, charitable giving. They tend to be better leaders uh, and their leadership is characterized by a friendlier, more amicable relationship with the people who they interact with. They, 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 um, they, they gather more respect from the people who they're leading as a result of, of expressing and, and sharing their gratitude. Uh, people who experience gratitude or who are prompted to experience gratitude experience another thing called elevation, which is when I'm grateful, I feel more sort of warm in the heart and, and interested or motivated to help somebody else. It's this kind of like viral thing. Gratitude spreads between people. Um, and when I'm experiencing gratitude, I look at others in a more humanistic and egalitarian way. My feelings are more likely to be in the realm of pro-social than fearful and, um, and hostile. And my friendships are, 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 are more meaningful, deep, and robust. 
So people who are more grateful tend to have more social capital. And looking specifically at relationships, and Sarah Algo, who is a friend of ours at The Greater Good and a, and a terrific researcher, has looked very deeply with Amy Gordon, another researcher and UC Berkeley grad, um, about how important expressions of gratitude between couples is to the quality and uh, endurance, um, enduring quality of, of, of relationships. And it turns out, probably not surprisingly, given the whole narrative thus far, that when couples share gratitude with one another, they are more satisfied and they're less likely to, their relationships are less likely to break up uh, over time. Um, this is just a quick uh, uh, figure from a research study that really tried to understand how gratitude works. Like, why does gratitude make people better at coping with stress? And I'll walk you through it. Gratitude was measured. Other uh, constructs or behavioral tendencies were measured. One of them was self-blame. One of them was positive reinterpretation and the sense of growth in the wake of a difficult or stressful experience. And then the third is behavioral disengagement. Um, we all know to some degree what those kinds of things feel like, getting really upset with yourself, feeling like what you've done is terrible and that you're a terrible person. Uh, if you look at the arrow between self-blame and stress, you see a positive number there. And that means that self-blame makes you feel more stress. If you look at the arrow between gratitude and stress, you'll see a negative number. What that means is that the more grateful you are, the less you're going to suffer from the symptoms and the outcomes of, of harboring long-term stress. If you look at the arrows between gratitude and behavioral disengagement, so behavioral disengagement, I'll just break that out. That really just means kind of cutting off, right? Being like, oh, you know what? I'm just not even gonna deal with this experience. I'm walking away. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm just not gonna invest any more feelings into it. it. Turns out that disengaging, although it's very attractive, you might think, oh, I'm just gonna separate, walk away, um, is, is associated with, with maintaining the stressful experience. The thing that works and that gratitude really adds to is our ability to reinterpret these difficult experiences in a positive way and then to actually derive some meaningful insight, and, and, and that falls under the category of growth, from those stressful experiences. And that that, again, predicts less likelihood, uh, uh, magnitude, and duration of stress. So this is really just a break it out so you do appreciate the extent to which researchers like Alex Wood, the author of this paper, have gone to break out why does this work, right? What is it that's happening when a person focuses on gratitude as, a, as an important aspect? And hopefully this, this whole little experience will inform some of your curiosities around where, where gratitude can be helpful in context where stress is a, is, a, is a real problem or a challenge or an issue. Uh, if gratitude can help you get better at, at working with that stress in a constructive way, who would argue against it as a valuable um, skill to, to bring into that kind of situation? This is another fun study done by Dave DeSteno, and I don't remember the first name of, of Mr. Bartlett, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, what these, these are social psychologists, and what they did was they brought people into a laboratory, and, and social psychologists are always fun because they kind of get to do these tricky paradigms where they don't really tell people what's going on, and there's always a secret experimenter who plays a role in it. Um, so the secret experimenter came in and the subject is working on a computer and suddenly in the middle of the study the computer breaks and the secret experimenter comes in and by secret the person who is in the study doesn't know that they're an experimenter hypothetically. They think it's just another subject, another person who's volunteered to be in the study. They come in and they go, oh, wait a minute, I think I know how to fix that. They go tick, 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 tick on the computer and it fixes. And the question was, after that experience of having been helped, how does the, uh, the person who was helped behave? Do they then turn around and behave more generously towards others? And what you're seeing is in the condition, which is marked green here, where the person that, who is called the benefactor, that's the person in the study, was helped, they're more likely to commit minutes of their time to volunteer to help another person, both the person who helped them and also a stranger after having experienced gratitude. 
So if you're ever wondering like, well, how could I, you know, it's kind of hostile in my workplace or people are kind of edgy. It's not a very warm and, and um, sort of cooperative or people, people are not as benevolent as I, as I would imagine I would like them to be like people in my family at home are. Um, this kind of data suggests that just um, having experiences where someone is kind to you and you experience gratitude is something that really uh, spreads around and, and leads to, to continued or, or added kindness between, between people in that context. Um, finally, uh, of course, as any other psychological construct gets studied in the lab, in individuals, in, psych in, in clinical contexts, they also get studied in the brain. This is uh, one of our former Greater Good Science Center research fellows, Glenn Fox, and um, who works with Antonio Damasio, also a, a forethinking person in the space of how emotions arise in the brain and where consciousness comes from. In any case, this team put put people into an fMRI scanner and measured which regions of the brain sort of come online or are most involved in, in feeling gratitude. And they used a very clever paradigm where they brought some uh, real life narratives into the lab and said, imagine that you're a kind of person who has been rescued, has been, has been served deeply through the generosity of another. And, and try to feel that gratitude that you would that, that that you know a person in that circumstance would have felt, and um, and and this is what they measured. They measured which areas of the brain were most active, and what you're looking at is structures in the midline ventral cerebral cortex, and what these areas are often implicated in is the rewarding value of social contact. So you know how you feel kind of warm and um, kind of delighted when you perhaps uh, reconnect with an old friend who you have spent lots of fun times with, um, when you feel the urge to approach and be close to another person. Um, this area is also implicated in uh, studies where we put mothers into a brain scanner and, and show them pictures of their own infants. So it turns out gratitude really uh, involves systems and networks in the brain that are important for our sense of social cohesion and affiliation and bonding. And it's one of the theories behind gratitude evolutionarily is that it's there to support our basic need to connect and cooperate and to be of support to one another as a species. Um, so just to summarize, that was a mouthful or a screenful or an earful, <laughs> lots of information. Um, when we think about how gratitude is working across the board, it, it essentially kind of makes one's life better. And um, we might call that amplifies the good by making it more likely that you're going to experience positive states. Um, our consciousness is limited to a certain uh, the quantity of information in a given time and we can fill that with anxious, uh, distressed, angry thoughts and sort of ideations or they can be filled with experiences that are focused on the goodness that's coming to us that really we didn't have to work for and that you know we can be grateful for. Um, and, and gratitude and gratitude practice again sort of shifts that that scope so that we do experience those positive states more readily and more frequently. Um, when people are more grateful, they remember the nice things about their lives more, more often and more easily. So given a list of, of primers or little reminders of, of different life experiences or lived experiences, gratitude makes you remember the good ones that you've had, which can be a service to your everyday sense of well-being. And then finally, uh, people practicing or, or being fortunate enough to be quite grateful to begin with tend to have stronger linkage between the systems that are dedicated to social cognition, that is understanding other people, connecting with other people, and systems that signal reward and pleasure. So we derive pleasure and um, meaning from our connections with others when we're grateful in a way that's different than when perhaps we're less grateful. Um, so I'm gonna shift directions for a second, and I know I'm getting close to uh, the amount of time I said I would talk, so I'm gonna just try to finish up fairly quickly. 
A recent survey that was conducted by the John Templeton Foundation to really assess attitudes of Americans about gratitude. This is what, and there was a whole bunch of questions on it. And I'm sharing with you two kind of key insights. The first one is that when people were asked, how do you feel about gratitude? Do you think it's important? Everyone named gratitude as a really important virtue or sort of moral value, right? We need gratitude. Gratitude really matters. And it's, it's a lucky kind of circumstance in this particular context, our idea challenge, because in some cases, there are ideas that are harder, they're more controversial. Um, gratitude really isn't controversial. It, you're going to be hard pressed to find someone who says, no, no, I think gratitude is a bad idea, right? So, and this survey kind of highlights that finding. Everybody thinks gratitude is good. And then we say, how grateful are you? And people say, I'm really grateful. And have you been getting more or less grateful over the last time? And he says, oh, I'm getting more and more grateful. And then it says, how grateful is the world? How grateful are other people? And people say, oh yeah, people are not grateful enough out there. And how, how do you think gratitude is changing out in the world and other people? And people say, the average <laughs> responder says, oh yeah, people's gratitude is going down and down. Um, so if you're a mathematical person, and even if you're not, you'll just have to kind of go with us on this one. That's not possible. It's not possible that each individual's gratitude is going up, right? But everybody else's gratitude is going down. It, it, it can't be what's really happening. So what we mean, what we kind of interpret from that is that the issue is that we're all feeling it, but we're not doing as much as we could to make our feelings of evident to others. We're not sharing it, right? Gratitude is a social emotion. It's about others. It's about something self-transcendent. And in order for that to, that message to get out there, we actually might be served by working a little harder to express it more readily, to, to make it clear that that's what is going on with us. And, and perhaps then other people would go, yeah, this person, everyone around me is grateful. I can see they're, they're communicating their gratitude. And that, that would, would change the tenor of that finding. The second finding is the survey asks people, where, where do you say thank you? Who do you say thank you to? And how often do you do it? And pretty much every question about the workplace was like, no, I don't say, I don't say thank you. Nobody thanks me. I never thank my boss, right? So there's something specific about the workplace and how we think about workplaces where the behavior of expressing gratitude is dramatically suppressed. And, and again, I think this is the driver in many ways of this particular IDEO Greater Good Science Center challenge. How can we reawaken gratitude in the workplace? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how scientists have tried to enable people to sort of foster more gratitude. One, uh, there's several studies showing that if you ask people to write a letter, a deep and thoughtful and descriptive letter, to a person whom they feel grateful, who perhaps they never actually thanked. Um, this is something that makes people's well-being you know, go up um, considerably, particularly if they go and actually either call the person and read it to them or, 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 or make a coffee date and, and read it to them in real, in face to face. Um, this is a very powerful and, and uh, important experience for kind of reconnecting with gratitude. You can keep a gratitude journal, and this would be sort of deliberately saying, okay, I'm gonna just bring gratitude more prominently into my day-to-day -day experience. Um, at the Greater Good Science Center, we've created one that is actually online, an online platform called thanksfor.org. Welcome to go check it out. It's free and uh, should be satisfy the purpose that other sort of spiral notebooks, um, gratitude journals satisfy, which is again, to kind of just create a greater sense of optimism, resilience, and interpersonal connection. Um, I've talked about just saying thank you more often, and we'll talk more about this in the Q&A because, and, and in a couple of slides, I'll go through what saying thank you actually means because we're not terrible at it. We just have taken a lot of shortcuts, and, and I'll go through that in a second. And then finally, there's a growing and emerging uh, science that looks at uh, kind of the intersection between gratitude and what you might call kind of contemplative exercises or mindfulness practices where you really spend some time carefully um, re uh, reflecting on gratitude uh, in, in your own life towards other people in a sort of, uh, in a sort of meditative fashion. And, and this is an emerging field where we're looking at different ways to, to build and strengthen and foster gratitude.
um, quickly. What are some of the challenges to gratitude? Um, we'll talk about this in the Q&A because I think we've got some questions that, that relate to this. Um, number one, as a culture, uh, particularly in the US and other um, leading uh, Western uh, countries, the, uh, there's an individualistic kind of um, approach to society and thinking that really your main goal is to maximize self-interest and accumulate resources and possessions that really are for you and, and maybe perhaps a very small group of, of family members is something that perhaps makes you less amenable to being grateful to a person who falls outside of that circle. Um, narcissism, uh, a trait of really, again, being overly self-focused and, and really noticing only what's going on with you. And then finally, the sense of entitlement. Um, there's an interesting dialogue slash controversy about the relationship between entitlement and gratitude, and particularly in young people. And there's some special sort of opportunity or affordance that gratitude has in perhaps the adolescent years, and parents always want to hear this, right? That, uh, that makes gratitude a, a way to reduce perhaps this, what seems to be a growing sense of entitlement. Uh, materialism, really focusing on the quality of life and the sense of self around what you own and what possessions you have is something that gets in the way of gratitude. And in a funny way, as much as these things get in the way of gratitude, um, gratitude is sort of a, a salve that, that chips away at them as, as factors that might kind of determine or dictate one's being out in the world. Um, being overscheduled, being uh, unable to actually notice anything going on around you, unable to stop and for a moment reflect on how others are contributing to the good things in your life can be a real barrier to gratitude, um, but perhaps less than we thought because it really doesn't take that much time. And then finally, when we think about context, and this one's particular the workplace, when we think about context in a transactional fashion, that means that we're doing what we do for money. We're not doing it to help anyone. We're not doing it for a bigger cause or purpose. It's only for getting paid. Thinking that way can really get in the way because often a boss might be like, well, I'm not gonna say thank you to you. I'm paying you. You're collecting a salary for, for the work that you do. So it's not, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of the success of my business or organization or enterprise. We're just paying you. And, and actually that, that doesn't work for humans. That's not how humans have evolved. Um, and, and so uh, we'll look into ways to kind of combat that. Just a last little fun finding from uh, Dan Ariely's lab, uh, looking at what's the difference between giving people cash or a coupon for a pizza or having the boss call them up uh, in how productive um, workers will be. They did this study in a in an Israeli tech uh, manufacturing uh, context. And what, what I want to highlight to you is that the day after the bonus, all three incentives worked pretty similarly. So 4.9, 6.7, 6.6%. So any kind of incentive makes people a little bit more productive. You, you might say, well, 6.6 .6 looks bigger than 4.9 and that might matter. But in their study, that was not statistically significant as a difference. Um, maybe that with more subjects and additional um, measures, they could pull that out. But what's really interesting is if you look at the column called day two. So they got a bonus and then their, their performance, their productivity went up slightly in all, in, in all um, conditions of, of different kinds of bonus. On day two, after they had gotten a bonus a day ago and they, and they weren't poised to get another one, right? They're not going to get another bonus uh, for the foreseeable future. Look at the cash condition, right? Productivity goes down by 13%. Look at the verbal reward condition. This is when the boss calls up and says, hey, you know what? Thanks a lot for working hard today. What you do really matters to our company. And I just want to acknowledge that, that, you, that you know, you're an important part of the whole, well, the whole enterprise. Um, so there's something funny about giving people money that is different than that expression of appreciation and gratitude for the work that people do. And this is a recent study. Dan Ariely's written a little book about sort of the surprises that, that, that these kinds of studies show, because most would have thought that the cash bonus would work just as well in the long term as, as a verbal expression. Um, I realize I'm 
three or four minutes over, so I'm again gonna go through this last little how to say thank you section pretty quickly. Um, if you wanna say thank you in a way that's really gonna make a difference, that's really gonna draw upon the power of gratitude to have an influence on your own mental life and the relationships that you share with others, home, family, in the workplace, um, there are three things that it really helps to include. And this is really drawn from McCullough's definition that I shared earlier in the, in the time that I've been speaking. One, say exactly what it is that you're thanking someone for. The kind of quick chin tilt, you know, eyebrow raise, thanks bra, is not enough. We know that. The, um, hey thanks, without, you know, without actually going into depth, and it's not like an hour here. We're talking maybe 30 seconds instead of one second, or even 10 seconds. It doesn't take long to do these once you get into practice of it. Describe what it is that you're thanking them for. What precisely did they do? Acknowledge the effort that they put into it. Make it clear that you appreciate what they put into, what they dedicated their time, their energy, their resources, their creativity into something that made a difference in your own life, and then it really helps to explain to them what it is that, how it helped you. Because then they can kind of empathically appreciate the joy or the relief or the meaning that you have gained or the sense of, of, of pleasure uh, and positivity that you've gained from, from the experience or the work that they have, that they have done to help. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna give you an example. Thank you for sharing your time with me on this Science of Gratitude webinar. I know you could be doing many other very important things and it adds terrific meaning and purpose to my work, knowing that other people are on board this effort to make the world a more grateful place. So that's my example. And um, that's, those are the slides I wanted to share. Excellent, thanks so much, Emiliana. I think that was really interesting. It's just amazing to go into that next level, you know, sort of the depth of research you've been able to do is just illuminating, uh, at least for me and hopefully for all of those of us joining. Um, so we're going to jump into the Q&A portion uh, of the webinar. We've got about 20 minutes and we've been sort of pulling out some of the questions you all have been sharing in the chat window and incorporating them into this slide deck. So we're going to queue that up and I'll hand it over to uh, Lauren who's going to run the Q&A portion. So just one moment as we share the screen. Hi everyone, and I know that um, Hannah's been doing a lovely job in the chat window, but just in case you haven't discovered it, and I know it looks a little bit different if you're calling in from a mobile device, but you will see chat and Q&A both at the bottom of your screen. To access the chat conversation that we've been having for the duration of the webinar, just click on the chat icon, and please feel free to submit any questions that you have. I'm, Emiliana shared so much incredible research and a depth of information, uh, so if you have follow-up questions, we'd be happy to forward those on to her um, during this Q&A session as well. Amazing, so just to give you a quick introduction about me, I'm Lauren and I am the community manager for this challenge. So you've probably seen me in the challenge if you've submitted something thus far commenting on your idea. Um, and now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of gratitude with Emiliana. So these are questions that we have um, had you guys pre-submit to the uh, webinar today and we pulled out a couple and like I said if you have follow-up questions as we go through these please feel free to chat them to us so the first one is what are some factors that make gratitude authentic or inauthentic and how do we spread grassroots gratitude from the ground up at companies or is it more effective um, or is it more effective from the top down? Yeah, great. Um, I'll, those are really two different questions and I'm, I'm delighted to see them. The first one is so important, this authenticity question. How do you create a scenario where when you actually find it in yourself to say thank you to someone, how do you ensure that they register that as a genuine, uh, sentiment that they don't register it as somehow manipulative or um, I, I don't know what else would what would be besides that if, if it is inauthentic and and we actually did have a, a, a greater good science center research fellow who was studying um, what he called gratitude in advance so if you ever had that experience we probably had it not not necessarily paid attention to it but hey thank you in advance for donating money to our cause 
or thank you in advance for staying late today at work, right? And maybe you hadn't even planned to do either of those things and you suddenly feel compelled or pressured or kind of um, like, you, like obliged to do those things. Um, so I'll just say thank you in advance is probably not a great uh, way to demonstrate authenticity I'm, I'm starting with how to make it inauthentic <laughs> and that said if you knew that someone had made a choice like if I knew that Lauren was gonna stay really late today or, or that she it is actually late where she is because she's not in the same physical geographic location as myself I could say hey Lauren I really appreciate that I know you're gonna take time out that, that you wouldn't normally take out to to, to do something tomorrow that's gonna help me. That, that, that expresses gratitude in a way that sounds genuine because I'm giving the sufficient uh, contextual detail. So number one, follow the three steps that I shared earlier. Explain in your expression of gratitude what it is that they did, right? And, and this works best when it's something that has happened already, right? It's not in an advance unless the happened is something you know they planned or committed to. Why acknowledge the effort and explain why it helps you or helped you, right? So, so when you give that much context and detail, it's hard to come across as somehow inauthentic. Um, the other things that help with authenticity just in general, not just for gratitude, but in interpersonal uh, in dynamics is making eye contact. Um, Dacher Keltner, my co-instructor for the Science of Happiness course, um, speaks a lot about the power of, of touch so humans are an ultra social species and one of the ways that we communicate trust um, and trust is, is a, a, an aspect of authenticity is, is, to, is through touch. So when, you, when, you're, when you're saying thank you, maybe a, an arm on the shoulder that is appropriate and well understood helps to make that uh, expression of gratitude feel authentic. So I think the trick is to, again, provide sufficient detail, explain the context. This is also consistent with work from Sarah Algo, who's looked at relationships and shown that when partners thank each other in a specific way that conveys my appreciation for how well I think you know me, right? You know that doing that is really gonna help me in a meaningful way because of our bond, because of our friendship. When you say thank you in that more detailed approach, you're conveying that, you're communicating that, and the, and the power of the gratitude is, is more prominent and, and rarely gets read as inauthentic. So I'll move to the top down versus bottom up um, kind of question. Uh, you know, spreading gratitude, it, it, there, there is, the, the question itself has this grassroots descriptor in it. Absolutely, it can be a trend where as one person takes on the habit and the practice of expressing their gratitude robustly and readily and widely, others will feel compelled to do also. It becomes a social norm. Um, if an, a leader is, uh, is inclined to take on the real and um, sort of genuine or authentic expression of gratitude, it can be quite effective also because the uh, culture of an organization often is weighted more heavily on the leadership style than necessarily on a grassroots effort. The best approach would be bi-directional, right? As, as is most cases, if a leadership is, is, is demonstrating and modeling gratitude as a, as a valuable and essential quality, that becomes an, an influence that then people in an organization can mirror and mimic and embody in their own right. And that becomes, again, the kind of spreading technique that's probably the most effective. Um, I think we could take another question. Wonderful. So we have a question that's come through the live chat about remote workplaces. Uh -huh. People were wondering if you don't physically share an office space with someone or if you are at a company with largely remote employees, how can gratitude become a part of that workplace? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, in my email correspondence, and this is more of an anecdotal response than a scientific response, um, I try to take the same approach that I recommend that people take interpersonally and face to face. So if I'm working with a remote colleague and we're our main mode of, of, of communication is via email or some other kind of project um, 
management software platform, uh, if and where I can actually <laughs> type out, hey, thank you for this thing that you did today that advanced the you know success of, of the project that we're working on together. Um, I know you probably have a lot of other demands on your time, and it makes a big difference for me knowing that we that we're gonna we're closer to hitting the milestone that that that, that matters. Uh, you know, it, it's not that hard, and and it, and it comes across. We we we're getting more and more used to that kind of virtual communication, and um, I think it, it, the opportunity to be more expressive is still there, and it's still powerful. Um, certainly, there is much to be gained from verbally expressing gratitude between remote workers when, when, we're, when we're connecting via video conferencing. I mean, I, I just did it in, in my, my presentation. I thanked all the people watching this webinar. I can't even see you, right? I can see the colleagues who are helping us organize this webinar. But I'm hoping that my saying those words and looking into my, you know, little green light where my, I know my computer camera is, uh, creates a scenario where, where there's at least a semblance of eye contact. So again, I don't think it's really that different. Um, I certainly think if you have a chance to meet in person, all interpersonal sort of emotional experiences are, are slightly more robust. But I, I don't think that there's not quite a bit of opportunity to introduce and add gratitude um, expression into your virtual and remote correspondence. Wonderful. Um, another question that we had come into our community was, how do you create space for gratitude at work when your workplace is a high stress, fast paced environment? Yeah, so remember one of my sort of barriers to gratitude was time. Um, when we put ourselves in contexts where we feel completely unabashedly and uncontrollably pressed for time, all things pro-social go out the window. Um, this is a, a tricky challenge. One of the classic studies of helping was, it's called the Good Samaritan study, and, and basically they took people who were in seminary school, right? So they're about to go give a lecture about the Good Samaritan, who is the person who's supposed to help everyone. And the study manipulated uh, the conditions such that some of the people were told, yeah, go ahead, your lecture is happening in this building. It's, you know, about a seven minute walk from here. Um, you need to be there in 15 minutes. Um, and the others were told, uh, oh, your you know, seminar is in this building, it's about a seven minute walk, you're supposed to be there in five minutes. And then what they did was as people were walking along the path to the lecture hall, there was someone who needed help, right? Somebody buckled over in pain. And they, again, anybody who's taken intro social psych will have learned this, the people who were pressed for time didn't do anything. They just kept walking, right? They were more worried about making it to the other thing they were obliged to make it to, delivering this lecture. Um, and they couldn't really orient to the, <clears throat> to the needs of this person who was suffering. Now, you might be going like, what does that have to do with gratitude? Well, if we're consumed in a way that feels very, um, uh, we, we don't have a lot of control over the time and the uh, deadlines and the culture that we're in uh, with a survival mode, gratitude's going to be harder. And, and it does sort of the onus of just making a decision on the part of the worker, right? That, okay, I'm going to at some level reject this culture of over stress and over scheduling and you know wearing a badge of of honor for the you know 95 hours that I worked this week uh, you know with, without eating and sleeping and exercising right um, I think uh, it, it's it's a it's a tricky kind of and slow redirecting of the boat when you're in a culture that's strongly um, identifies with this uh, stress mentality. Again, um, gratitude doesn't take that long, right? It just doesn't. People, it's not like I'm asking or we're advocating spending an hour every day meditating in a special mindfulness room, which would also be delightful, <laughs> especially for those, uh, you know, highly stressed workplaces. But, you know, is there a way in the midst of all that, like, you know, frenzy 
to take a deep breath and for a moment reflect on what's going well and then communicate to the people who are involved in what's going well your appreciation for them. I mean, it's a challenge, but it's certainly not impossible. And in many regards, it's probably a bigger impact, right? If you're in a really kind of warm and cooperative and sort of balanced workplace, adding gratitude will perhaps make it a little bit nicer and, and, and bring a little more cohesion and closeness. But if you're starting from ground super stress and everybody's competing and threatened by everybody else because their work is so important and anything anybody asks them to do and on top of that is 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 too crazy um gratitude can you know just pausing for a minute and, and invoking gratitude can make a much can make a big difference it doesn't have to slow things down in, in terms of the pace of progress in fact it it may because you eliminate some of the interpersonal conflict and kind of difficulties associated with a strictly high stress competitive organizational culture, um, you may actually find that an organization becomes more efficient and more productive when gratitude becomes more front and central as a value. Wow, amazing. Wow, so many, so many rich insights. Um, moving on to another question from our community is how do you build excitement and get buy-in from a large corporation to start spreading messages of gratitude? Yeah, well, so building excitement is kind of a fun one because gratitude already feels good. So it's sort of like, how do you build excitement about fresh baked cookies on Thursdays, right? Well, you don't really have to. You just put them out there and people get excited and they come and they, and they want them and it makes them smile. Gratitude is a little bit like that. Like people like it. It feels good. Our nervous system responds by signaling pleasure and safety and uh, trust and connection and affiliation when we're sharing gratitude with others. So, you know, building excitement, again, it's sort of just put it out, right? And, and you'll see that it kind of uh, gleans its own momentum. Um, Buy-in can be trickier only because we have a legacy and a history of um, a kind of logic-bound, rational economic model for what uh, works for productivity in organizations. And it turns out, as we know from Danny Kahneman and other economists who have kind of uh, spread out into psychology and neuroscience, people really need to incorporate pro-social cooperative opportunities into their day in and day out experiences to feel content, to feel um, like they're fulfilling what, what is most satisfying in their lives. So, um, when you take away basic needs like that, what an organization has to then deal with is turnover, right? People feeling underappreciated and leaving their jobs. What you have to deal with is sickness, uh, days taken off, people not maintaining the uh, optimal sense of balance and well being that enables them to be resilient and there there is definitively the right times and places where work stress is helpful right there are deadlines there are true things that have to be done in a certain amount of time and it might be a little stressful to be ready for it and that stress actually is a service to us being effective and getting ready but adding that stress together continuously and perpetually is really problematic so um it's a bottom line question at the end of the day, like for leaders, like do you want your workplace to be one that is characterized by constant turnover, demands on rehiring, having to deal with people as uh, sort of in if, in if unproductivity as a result of not being physically and emotionally well, um, not being effective in teams, right? When, when people are, 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 when the culture is one of gratitude, teams are more productive and creative and innovative. So it, it, it kind of becomes a pretty easy bottom line productivity question at the end of the day. We're really working on 
like specific numbers. So how can you say, well, productivity will go up by 22% if you have more gratefulness in an organization. There are several metrics like that. I don't have them at the tip of my tongue. And I honestly um, would prefer more evidence to be in the, in the general sphere of, of literature, of research literature in this space. But again, that's partly what this challenge is about. It's really kind of driving the issue, planting the seeds of inspiration. If an organization is gonna do an initiative, we would be really excited to be able to assess the impact of, on an organization and specifically for these bottom line metrics. Wow. So we have, um, fortunately, time for one final question. And we're going to end up with a question from David that came through the chat for our webinar today. And he asked, can there be gratitude without trust? Ooh, and, um, there's probably a different depth of gratitude when you trust versus don't trust someone. Um, I can imagine uh, there still being value and gratitude may be a way of actually really fostering or building trust. Um, gratitude can be a, a way of demonstrating uh, a certain degree of sort of vulnerability and vulnerability tends to, to foster or foment trust. Um, some might feel like, oh, I don't want to say thank you because that indicates somehow that I wasn't the only one in charge and the only sort of actor that made this successful thing happen. Um, well, that's a way to, to, to kind of to, to acknowledge that, in fact, you probably weren't, right? There's very few circumstances, very few human achievements and accomplishments that are the result of a single individual's effort. Um, so... I think it, it, it may be harder to practice absent of trust. If I really don't trust someone, but I'm faced to thank them for something that they did, that would be a challenge that would be different than saying thank you to someone who I really do trust, partly because of that vulnerability piece and, um, and, uh, and partly just the, the intrinsic motivation to express gratitude or, or, or positivity towards somebody who, I, who I'm I'm not sure is going to serve my best interest. On the other hand, I think there's value in the, well, what do you really have to lose, right? If you can, if you can just do it anyway, right? Just say thank you when it is the appropriate context, when somebody who may perhaps you don't trust has done something to help you, it will make, add more trust into that, that dynamic and, and it'll give more potential to the relationship to thrive. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emiliana, for um, answering all of our community questions. And thank you so much to our community for being so engaged for the duration of this webinar. And I'll, head, or I'll turn it on over to Chris. Yeah, again, as Lauren said, thank you so much to everybody. I, you guys are so engaged in the chat. It's, it's wonderful to see sort of that level of interest in those live questions. As I mentioned, we'll do our best to pull out some of those unanswered ones into a document. And we'll sort of share written responses with our community. Um, again, it's just great to see. And again, thank you to Emiliana for her, sharing her expertise. It's just wonderful to hear that depth of knowledge. So I want to encourage you all, if, if you found this sort of inspiring, or if this opened up new ways of thinking or gave you different ideas of, of how to think about gratitude, we really encourage you to jump into the challenge and post a, uh, a submission into the research phase. Uh, we've got about eight days left. And again, um, then uh, gather up a team in your workplace uh, with friends, uh, or just on your own and, and create a, and start to build and brainstorm an idea uh, to actually post in the ideas phase of the challenge, which kicks off on Wednesday, uh, July, uh, September 27th. And so for, uh, for those ideas, I just wanted to quickly run through some of the evaluation criteria that we'll be looking for uh, while we're assessing uh, our top ideas in, in a couple months time. And so we'll be looking for questions that answer our how might we uh, statement, um, question, uh, ideas that focus on internal um, organizational gratitude, uh, ideas that focus on authentic expressions of gratitude, systemic expressions of gratitude, and then some of our open ideal values. I want to make sure those ideas are human-centered, innovative, contextually relevant to the, the information that we shared in the brief, uh, as well as scalable. So start to think as you gather a team and, and work with, uh, with your colleagues around this topic, how you might incorporate some of those criteria into your concepts. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. It was lovely to have you here. And thanks to Emiliana. It was wonderful to, to hear your insights.
Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Take care, everyone.